Hey guys, lesson seven, ion and Bohr models. So we're gonna repeat our ion charges on the periodic table. We're then gonna draw cation Bohr models and draw anion Bohr models. If you have no idea what a Bohr model is, go back to lesson six. So if you remember from lesson four, cations are positive ions that have lost electrons. So if you look at all these lovely examples in the bottom corner, and then anions are negative ions that have gained electrons and again you can see the charges and the common ions in the in the corners of the periodic element and don't forget if it's a positive charge it means you lost electrons it means you have more positive in the nucleus than you do when you have those yeah. and if you have gained electrons you have more electrons outside than there are protons inside so therefore your overall charge is negative more negative electrons make everything more negative. Less negative electrons make everything more positive. Okay, so cations, again, these are the positive ions. Uh, they're neutral elements that have lost electrons. Ions, uh, the ion charge is in the top right corner, and the positive number tells us how many electrons the element actually lost. Um, you have to understand that the atomic radius will actually get smaller because of the loss of the whole energy level. So remember the principal energy levels from the Bohr models, the actual rings? In the case of like potassium, you know, not my girlfriend, the K, but when that potassium has that plus one ion, it loses that only electron and drops down an entire principal energy level. So how many rings should potassium have normally? So normally it should have four, but as a cation, because it's losing its one electron, it's going to end up with three. Ah, so it's getting smaller. It's getting smaller. It loses a whole layer. So here's our element Bohr model. That means titanium, the element, is neutral. So you have the configuration of 2, 8, 10, 2. Noticing with both the dots and the actual numbers on each line. Now, if we were to draw the titanium plus two ion, you're noticing that it's slightly smaller in size. It only has three rings, and there are no more two electrons in the outermost level. If you have a titanium plus three, not only do you still have three rings, but you don't have 10 electrons on the outermost level, you only have nine. And likewise with titanium plus four, you drop from nine electrons in the outermost level to only eight. Now remember, the atomic number, 22, means you have 22 electrons. The positive charge, 2, 3, or 4, means the number of electrons lost. And you always lose from the outermost and then work your way in. Mm. Okay, so anions, again, as they're neutral elements that gain electrons, uh, anions only use the first number on the list. Negative numbers will tell you how many electrons the element has actually gained in this case. So the atomic radius is going to increase because there's more negative electrons in one location and they're going to actually repel away from each other. Thus, their radius gets bigger because of the repelling factor. Yeah. So here we have two different nonmetals. We have sulfur and fluorine. Both of these are anions. And sulfur, when you look at its charge, the most common is negative two. That means it's gaining two electrons in its outermost layer. So you're going from a configuration of 286, as you see in the element side, to a configuration of 288. Same thing for fluorine. Fluorine has a negative one charge, so it goes from seven electrons in its outermost principal energy level to eight electrons. Now these, are, these cannot exceed the number of electrons that can possibly be held in that energy level, though. So, for example, fluorine, on that second energy level, you can't go past the number 8. So fluorine can never go past a negative 1 charge because it reaches that 8 with just the 1. So make sure you reference your reference tables and don't be writing down ion charges that are not listed on the periodic table. Exactly. 